Scientists from the Netherlands and the UK recently identified microplastics in two areas of the human body where they have never been seen before. The tiny plastic particles were found deep in the lungs of some surgical patients and in the blood of anonymous donors. Researchers have known humans consume microplastics by eating contaminated seafood, but we're now learning that it's possible to take in these particles through the air that we breathe. For more, I'm joined by Lee Shemitz and Paul Anastas. Lee is the president of Sound Waters, which works to protect and preserve the Long Island Sound through educational programs. And Paul is the director of the Center for Green Chemistry and Green Engineering at Yale University. Welcome to both of you. You know, reading up on this topic, two things really stood out to me. How little is known and how prevalent these microplastics are. So Lee, I want to start with you on that latter point. How do microplastics end up in the air? Microplastics um, come into the environment, um, as Paul has written, in through both secondary and primary ways, uh, secondary and primary sources. So some of them times they are actually put into um, products and come into the environment that way. And the other is they're in the plastic that we all use that they breaks down into secondary sources. I was also stunned by one statistic that I want to share with our viewers. National Geographic reports that in 2020, 367 million metric tons of plastics were manufactured, but that number is expected to triple by 2050. Paul, what more can you tell us about how plastics break down and become microplastics? And do these particles ever disappear? So that's the, uh, the, the really important point. They break up, but they don't break down. What I mean by that is that they crumble, they are brittle, they fracture into smaller and smaller and smaller pieces. But they don't break down, meaning that the chemical bonds that hold them together don't degrade into the environment the way our natural materials do. And so one of the things that um, we have to look at is how do we design that next generation of plastics and polymers and materials so that we get all of the properties, all of the functionality that we want out of them without all of these uh, undesirable consequences. Mm. Well, Lee, the long-term health impacts of microplastics are still unknown. There is one study that found quail chicks seem to adapt to the plastics being in their body, but we don't yet know what these particles could do to the human body. Tell us what are some of the concerns? Well, the concerns are manifold, and as you said, we don't know yet, but what we do know is that there are impacts, that there, the plastic, as you pointed out, um, is prevalent throughout the environment, and a lot of what we work at at Soundwaters is both how to reduce plastic use, how to remove plastics from the environment, and also how to engage young people in thinking about this going forward, because it is a somewhat terrifying idea to be thinking about, and to give young people the tools to understand it and the tools to combat it is really critical in helping them confront their anxiety and their fear of the future with this. Uh, Paul, what are some of the greener options to plastic, and are there options to make plastics greener? So the, the good news answer is, is absolutely yes. So there's a, a worldwide community of, of people doing green chemistry, which is not only impacting plastics, but really all of the chemicals of our daily life. And so we can build plastics starting with bio-based renewable feedstocks that the, the body and the biosphere actually knows how to deal with and how to degrade. So it's not only good at the, at the beginning of its life, the, what it's manufactured from, but it also will degrade harmlessly into the environment at the end of its useful life. And on the other, uh, the other question, greener options to plastics? Yes, there are many, starting with um, things like agricultural wastes. Uh, you can transform these type of plant-based products that don't compete with food or feed for animals and, and don't cause problems with land use, but yet supply bio-based feedstocks for a new generation of plastics. And these new polymers, these new plastics, can give you even superior performance. So this is what green chemistry is all about. It's all about how you make better performing substances without all of the unintended consequences like microplastics. Very, very interesting. 
Finally, Lee, how can we as individuals avoid contributing to additional micro microplastic pollution? Well, one critical way is to eliminate single-use plastics in our lives. And that's not reduce it, but it's actually eliminate it. Challenge our assumptions of what we need, um, what we need to carry, how we carry things. Um, and partly that's a reset from COVID because there were many people who were moving away from plastics and understandably in the fear of the pandemic moved back to, uh, to a lot of plastic coatings in their life. Um, the other is to do cleanups, both in daily life, um, again, picking things up, involving uh, with organizations that do cleanups, and advocating. Um, bans make a difference. We've seen it locally here in Stanford. We've seen it globally um, all, across the, all across the world. When a ban goes into place, plastic use um, becomes universally, ex plastic, a lack of plastic of use uh, becomes universally accepted. So advocating for that in governments, you know, from local to national to international is also Key. We can reduce the use and therefore the amount of plastic going into the environment going forward. Especially since we know that these plastics don't go away, they stay in our environment and we don't know what the impacts are yet. Lee Shemitz, Paul Anastas, thank you both.